Terra incognita speculative fiction. Terra incognita speculative fiction. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisaf.com.au for links to our featured authors' website and publications. This month's featured writer is Nathan Burridge, Sydney-based speculative fiction author of the novel Fivefold. Nathan's work has appeared in a wide range of Australian magazines over the last 10 years, and his story for TISF, Black and Bitter Thanks, was shortlisted for the 2008 Aurealis Awards. We live in a throwaway society that seems to have lost much of its humanity, but if you think the future looks black and bitter now, it can always get a lot worse than you fear. Two coffee mugs sit on the scratched, laminated table that is the centrepiece of my kitchen. One is blue and chipped in half a dozen places. You might say it has character. The other is green and unremarkable. I pour filtered coffee into each mug. My hands are steady, but the joints in my fingers ache as they often do these days. Milk goes into the green cup, followed by sugar. More than is good for me. I don't add anything to the blue one. Steam curls above its rim like an accusing finger. Memory is hard and unforgiving, like a metaphysical spoon stirring the bitterness in. It's raining outside. The sky is grey and oppressive, matching my mood. The letter from the Department of Welfare Services is still propped against the window sill. I should take it down or burn it. I sit this way for a long time, watching the long black cool, sipping my own diluted brew, wishing I had the courage for something stronger, remembering someone who did. We met in a bar, one of those forgotten pubs that felt like an RSL, except it wasn't. Dozens of unemployed, many of them not much older than me, congregated within its walls. They'd stare at you as if you'd interrupted a family gathering, clutching their form guides and their fourth beer of the morning. It was a Thursday. The monotony of my administration role had driven me out of the office. I wasn't quite so old then, although if you look closely in the reflection of my life, you could see time was about to tap me on the shoulder. Beer in hand, I wandered through the intermittent gloom and tired furniture, restless without knowing why. Sunlight angled through grubby windows, strips of light slatting across the floor. The carpet was sticky, the smell of dead cigarettes overpowering. Hopelessness filled the air, thick as incense. You breathed it in, and it knew you, knew that you were divorced, and had no family that gave a shit about you, knew that you belonged here. Welcome, brother, it seemed to say. Welcome to the rest of your days. The clack of billiard balls drew me deeper into the pub. I've always loved pool. It's a skillful game when played on a full-sized table. Clarence was holding court, giving two other guys a lesson and earning some beer money along the way. My first impression of him was a lasting one. He leaned over the table, broad face intent, as he focused on a long pot, pale blue eyes narrowed beneath thick white eyebrows. Bad luck, mate. Do you want to play for double or nothing? They say a face can tell you the story of someone's life, but I reckon only the honest ones do. Clary's was like that, uncompromising in its honesty, almost naked in its refusal to hide what life had written there. You could see it in the crow's feet when he smiled, and even more so when he frowned. The jutting chin was argumentative by nature, but tempered by his ready grin and open demeanour. Clary was a man who had opinions. That was a given, and he wasn't prepared to change them for anyone. Perhaps that was why I was drawn to him. Other challengers had left a row of coins on the edge of the table. I dropped two bucks at the end of the queue and waited, content to remain in the shadows while I watched. Clary's old flannelette shirt and faded jeans suggested a construction background, but he carried himself with unexpected grace. He toyed with each opponent in turn, never letting anyone get on the black before he potted it. He always did like to win. When my turn came, I was lucky enough to sink one off the break. I potted another three in quick succession and snookered him when I couldn't get a clear shot at any of my remaining balls. What did you say your name was? 
Clary asked, peering at me beneath the green lamps suspended over the table. Keith, I replied. He concentrated after this exchange, narrowly losing a black ball game. After I won, he insisted we play again, and the other players drifted away beneath his impassive stare. Clary won the next five games in a row, and I accepted this with unusually good humour. He bought me a beer afterwards, and we spent the rest of the day talking about the way our lives were meant to be, the reasons for our failed marriages, the state of the economy, anything except how we actually felt about these things. We bumped into each other again at a pub a week later. Clary was dressed in the same clothes he wore the first time we met, but his eyes were bloodshot and his speech slurred. I offered to buy him a coffee and he accepted, so we went to a cheap cafe near my flat. He was in no condition to walk home and couldn't afford a cab, so I suggested he bunk down at my place. We talked in that aimless fashion when only one person is drunk, the conversation turning in circles as Clary struggled for coherency and I struggled to keep up with his thoughts. Eventually he fell asleep, head slumped on the laminated table in my kitchen. I left him to it, too self-conscious to move him. The next morning, I woke to the sound of the kettle boiling and cupboards banging. I found Clary shuffling around my kitchen, white hair sticking up like a pissed-off cockatoo's crest. He clutched a chipped blue mug in one hand and gave me a wild, accusatory look. You got any decent coffee in this place? Because I could bloody well do with some. Of course. I took the ground coffee from the fridge and set about exercising his hangover. Clary watched me, running a knotted hand over the stubble on his chin. How do you take it? Black and bitter, like me soul, he replied, with no hint of self-deprecation. I smiled and we sat down across the table. You don't have anywhere to go, do you? Clary took a sip from his mug and nodded, whether in approval of the coffee or in agreement I couldn't tell. Do you? I'm not one to push, but in my experience pride stiffens with age. Maybe choices, Clary said, cradling the cup in his hands. I have to stick by him. A lesser man would have tried to explain, but not Clary. That's when I realised that I needed him to stay, not the other way around. I needed his casual decisiveness, his uncompromising certainty in my life. Besides, if I was honest, I was lonely as hell. You could stay with me for a bit, I offered, if you want. Reckon that'd be all right, he said, and that's how it began. The letter didn't arrive until much later. You seen this? Clary thumped the newspaper on the table, almost knocking over my coffee. His colour was high, cheeks puffed out and white stubble bristling. Good morning. I slept well, thank you. Look, he shoved the paper at me. The front page contained an article on the Pension and Social Services Assessment Act, or PISA, as Clary had dubbed it. He'd highlighted sections of it with a yellow marker. Dropping ratio of workers to retirees. Over-reliance on government pensions, falling superannuation investment returns, continued immigration to bolster the economy unsustainable, withdrawal of welfare inevitable, humane solutions required. Well? he demanded. Well what? I sipped my coffee not knowing what he expected of me. You're in the government. You should be doing something about this. Clary, I work for the local council, not the federal government. They're hardly going to listen to someone so far down the food chain. But they're talking about old folks like they're some sort of burden on society. What about the building sites I worked on, the taxes I paid? Okay, so I didn't fight in the war, but I'd done my share. He banged the table with a clenched fist. Clary, I began, surprised by the violence. I never asked for nothing, you hear? They kicked me out of my apartment because I couldn't pay the rent, and I copped that. But it's not right, this ballot system. It's not bloody humane at all. And you shouldn't be sitting on the fence. A flush crept down from the white roots of his hairline. What ballot system? I'm not a drain on resources, he said, and stormed from the room. Not knowing what else to do, I finished reading the article. The government's proposal was leaked by an anonymous official from the Department of Welfare Services. Despite the apparent veracity, I reread the article and still couldn't believe it. I went looking for Clary to tell him that the bill would never get past the Senate, but he left, no doubt in search of a more sympathetic audience. The apartment felt empty with him gone. In the silence, I wondered where my outrage was. Why wasn't I as passionate about this as Clary? Another ten years or so, and I'd be part of the target demographic. And the answer, when it came to me, was more shameful still. A man should know his limitations, what he can and can't achieve, especially at my age. And it had been a long time since I'd felt young. Clary dragged me along to the demonstrations. It was the first time I'd left the ranks of the silent majority, and while I felt uncomfortable, I was exhilarated as well. People from all walks of life turned out. 
The media interviewed bawling grandchildren seated on the shoulders of their grandparents. A cavalcade of senior citizens swarmed down Commonwealth Avenue in Canberra, their motorised wheelchairs clogging traffic. It would have been hilarious if it wasn't so tragic. A small contingent of the protesters argued the economic value of the aged. They pointed out caring for grandchildren allowed parents to work. They talked about the aged care industry and the number of people it employed. It was enough to force a referendum. Accountants and economists appeared in commercial breaks, explaining their pension forecasts and warning of economic disasters to come. Senior citizens and their supporters responded, invoking the Anzac spirit and their sacrifices of earlier generations to keep our country free. The campaign was bloody and ruthless. It ravaged the face of the nation and divided people like nothing had ever before. In the end, though, a majority of Australians and four of seven states voted in favour of PISA. The Act was passed six months later to massive public outcry. It was challenged in the High Court, which deemed it constitutional 4-3. to three. An appeal was lodged with the International Court of Human Rights, but to no avail. The first annual pension ballot was held four months later. I made Barry wear a suit. He hated the stiff formality of it, but it made him look presentable. As an employee of the council, I was required to assist with the local broadcast. I'll never forget that first group of candidates. Retirees without independent income, scared and bewildered by how society had turned its back on them. I spent the day on the verge of tears, giving directions, handing out water, hating myself for being part of this, but wanting to provide comfort where I could. The speeches were the worst. A quivering, emaciated lady who could barely stand unassisted. My name is Cecilia Layton, and I'm 93. Please don't vote for me to lose my pension, because I have seven grandchildren and eleven great-grandchildren. An Asian gentleman with a thick accent. I am Henry Ling. I am 79 year of age. You not vote for me because I am still active a member of community. A florid-faced, portly fellow. I'm Thomas Linton and I've lived in this electorate for the last 60 years. Paying me a pension is just returning some of the taxes I paid over that time. What's that? Speak up, will you? Oh, I'm 84. And so it went, a parade of outraged, tearful or terrified senior citizens having to justify themselves to a faceless telecast, until it was Clary's turn. He stomped into the broadcasting zone and glared at the camera. I'm Clarence Lindell. I'm 79 years of age, and you're all bastards for letting this happen. That was it. He had another 45 seconds to plead his case, but refused to dignify the whole process with another word. I wanted to scream and cheer at the same time. The next pensioner took his place, fumbling with the microphone and stuttering. I took Clary by the elbow and dragged him to one side. What was that? I asked in a low voice. The voice of conscience, Clary replied, tilting his chin. Jesus, Clary, do you know what's at stake? Of course I bloody do. A simple thing called human dignity. Reckon you should think about that. He glanced around the makeshift studio with a scornful expression. I let his arm go. I'll see you back at the flat when you're done here. Larry walked off, and all my arguments collapsed into self-loathing. Or perhaps that was just easier than doing something about the choices I hadn't made. Ballot results were returned a week later. The letter from the Department of Welfare Services arrived, three days after that. They're coming today, aren't they? Clary glanced up over the rim of his blue cup. Yes. His voice was subdued, his eyes too bright. Why couldn't you just... He held his hand up rebutting anything I might say. Please, I never asked nothing of you until now. Let's not fight about this. I couldn't let it go. Are you trying to make a statement? Do you really think the world is listening? My voice was rising, but I couldn't help it. Yes. His voice became softer as mine grew louder, refusing to escalate the conflict. You're not that naive. Reckon someone has to be. Clary, there aren't going to be any cameras. It won't be glorious if that's what you're thinking. Then you must tell me story. Who else is going to do it? He drained his cup and left the room. I picked up the mug and swirled the dregs, trying to find a way to dissuade him. They rang the doorbell at precisely 8pm, just as the letter had promised, under the cover of darkness, as Clary put it. Do you want to get that? Clary called in a breezy voice. I opened the door, my heart pounding. A young, clean-shaven man in a striped suit, but no tie, stood in the hall with two armed security guards. Good evening. My name is Stephen, and I'm a private contractor working for the Department of Welfare Services. 
He checked his clipboard. Is Mr. Clarence Lindell here? No, I said, attempting to close the door. One of the guards caught the door frame and gave me a warning look. Present, Clary called from the sofa in the lounge room. Show me your ID, I said, clutching at a breach in protocol. Stephen produced the required documentation, but still I hesitated. Sir, it's a federal offence to obstruct our work, Stephen said. We can force our way into your home if you prevent access to Mr. Lindell. Nothing would give you more pleasure, would it? I'm just here to do a job, Stephen the contractor replied. It's up to you how unpleasant this has to be. The two guards shouldered past me, and Stephen followed them down the hallway into the living room. Stephen unplugged the TV at the socket and sat in a chair opposite Clary. Mr. Lindell, do you understand why I'm here? One of the guards took up position behind Clary. The other stood just behind my left elbow. Yeah, I know why you're here. Do you? Clary gave him a wide smile, and I could only admire his courage. Then you know that I am duly authorised by the government under the Pension and Social Service Assessment Act to enforce the pension ballot results, Stephen said. Do you understand these results? Do you like your job, Stephen? Clary's expression didn't change, but I heard the subtle shift in his voice. That's not relevant, sir. Do you understand the results? I'll answer your question if you answer mine first. The guard standing behind Clary shifted on his feet, but Stephen shook his head. No, sir, I don't particularly like my job, but the economics of our situation are irrefutable. I believe we have no choice but to allocate our resources to the future, not the past. Ah, the children, Clary smiled. Really should have stuck with mine in hindsight. I could have watched them grow up to be like you. Stephen stiffened. Yeah, I understand the results, Clary said in a flat voice. Let's get on with it. Very well. Stephen opened a case and withdrew a sheet of paper with a table of statistics. These are the official results from the pension ballot in descending order of votes. Is that your full name and date of birth? Stephen pointed at a row near the bottom of the page. It is. Clary's mouth had become a thin line and he began to tremble. Finally, I bit my lip. And you understand the electorate has voted to discontinue your pension benefits, effective immediately. Yep. Do you have any material assets to support yourself? Any foreign accounts or unrealised superannuation entitlements? An inheritance, perhaps? Stephen seemed to be reading an invisible script, distancing himself through professionalism. Nope. I moved forward instinctively, but the guard's hand closed around my elbow. Keep out of it, he said in a low voice. Do you have anyone who can meet your financial obligations? Stephen asked. Yes, I said, straining against the guard's grip. No, Clary said at the same time. Stephen hesitated, glancing between us. You can't afford it, Clary said in a gruff voice. Not both of us, and I'll be buggered if I let you end up in my shoes. We can... No! He turned back to Stephen. Keep going. Stephen had the decency to look uncomfortable before continuing. Given the strain on the public welfare system and your lack of financial independence, it is government policy to relocate elderly citizens who lose the ballot to specialised care facilities. The nearest one is... Stephen made a show of consulting another sheet of paper. Just outside of Lithgow. You can't put him in a place like that, I protested. Being in local government, I knew the facility used to be the Lithgow Correctional Centre, complete with unscalable walls and spotlights. During winter, it was one of the coldest and wettest places in the state. Hardly an ideal location for the aged and infirm. Other centres had been established around the country, the names synonymous with detention. Woomera, Villawood, Port Headland. This is not America, Stephen replied. We don't abandon our people to the streets. Relocating senior citizens to a central facility is the only way the government can continue to support them. And heaven forbid the lucky country should be reminded what happens when you outlive your usefulness, I snapped. The referendum showed the majority of people don't agree, Stephen said. We'll need your Medicare and Social Security cards, he said to Clary. Got them right here. Clary tossed the cards on the coffee table with a dismissive flick of the wrist. Unperturbed, Stephen opened his briefcase and withdrew a compact card reader. He fed each card into the machine. It beeped once before spitting them out. The magnetic strips were no doubt erased, just like Clary's future. Stephen put the reader back in his case and snapped the locks. Mr. Lindell, we're ready to transport you to the facility now. Do you have any belongings you can carry with you? Clary gave him a level stare. Mr. Lindell? Got one bag in me room, Clary said with a nod in the direction of the second bedroom. Franks, get the bag, 
Stephen said to the guard standing behind Clary. Christ, I can carry me own bloody bag. Clary stood and waved the guard off. It's not like I got much, as you pointed out. Stephen nodded at Franks, who followed Clary towards the bedroom. Clary stopped in the doorway. We can't help getting old, you know. Strangely, his gaze was fixed on me, not Stephen. I turned to Stephen, assessing options for a last-minute reprieve, bribes, threats, an appeal to compassion, but he avoided my gaze. Clearly, it had all been tried before. Suddenly, the lights flickered and went out. Someone cried out in the darkness, followed by a heavy thud. Stephen and the guards shouted at each other. I rushed towards Clary's room, avoiding the furniture and flailing men. The smell of burning plastic filled my small apartment. Sparks arced into the darkness from the far wall of the bedroom. A beam of light swept across the floor. Stephen was at my shoulder, pushing me aside. His torch probed the bedroom. I saw the knife first. One of my good butter knives, silver-plated, jutting from the power socket in the wall. Clary lay face down on the floor, one hand twitching beneath the knife. Franks was swearing in a monotone voice that could have been mistaken for prayer, but he made no move to help. Stephen knelt next to Clary and checked his pulse. A minute later he stood, made a short call on his mobile, and then ordered the guards out. I'm sorry, was the most he could muster before he left. Much later, after the ghastly circus of paramedics, counsellors and legal representatives had left with Clary's body, I collapsed on the couch. I felt exhausted and abandoned and then ashamed of being so selfish. Time to go to work. Some stubborn, repetitive part of me knows this. The funeral was held yesterday. Nobody came except me, the reverend and a government official, although he didn't stay very long. During the ceremony, I imagined composing a dozen different letters to the newspapers. I orchestrated a guerrilla campaign via the internet, a letter drop in my electorate, vilifying them for killing the most honest man I have ever known. None of these plans will be realised, of course. With Clary gone, it was past time for me to return to my place in the queue, to return to the silent, accepting masses. He'd made his protest and was met with a wall of indifference. Nothing had changed. Clary's cup of cold coffee is still sitting on my kitchen table. I focus on it, channeling all the emotion I'm feeling, all the memories I hold. Come on, Clary, give me a sign. Anything. I don't know how long I sit that way, waiting for something to happen. My head is aching and I feel hollow. Next week is my 57th birthday. The council's mandatory retirement age is 60, but that policy might change once the older civil servants realise what specialised care facilities really meant. I imagine my contemporaries planning their ballot speeches, wheedling their way into charities and philanthropic causes justifying their existence. The images make me nauseous. The letter is waiting for me on the windowsill. Time to take it down to let go of what's happened before it hurts too much. Too many of my protective fictions have already been stripped away. I lurch to my feet and clutch the envelope. On the back of the letter is unfamiliar handwriting, large, rough letters that say, Look inside. I've never seen Clary's handwriting, but it must be his. The letter from the government advising that Clary's pension had been terminated is gone. In its place is a handwritten letter and Clary's will. Keith, I want to say thanks for taking me in. He didn't ask for nothing in return, and that's been a rare thing in my life, so I'm grateful. I'm sorry to have put you through this, but I did tell you early on I stick by my choices. Thanks for respecting that. I have some land, Owen, and no one but you to give it to. All the details are in me will. I want you to sell it and set yourself up. Stop working for those bastards. And if there's any money left over, I want you to fight for other people like me. Do you reckon you can do that? You're probably wondering why I didn't do that myself. It's hard to explain. You never had kids, but I did. I can't tell you how bad it feels, seeing what they become, and knowing you're responsible. And you can't take it back, can you? You can't change nothing. That's a hard thing, Keith. Maybe that's what you should tell them. What it's like when you look back and it's too late to fix your mistakes. Clarence. I'm shaking as I read this. It's like he's standing next to me, hand on my shoulder, telling me to do the right thing, asking me to find courage where he couldn't. Clary has brought me to the edge of my tolerance, and suddenly I am so angry there is no room for doubt or fear, only a consuming need to extract some meaning from his death. In that moment, I finally understand who his protests were really for, not the son he'd failed or the politicians who'd fed a culture of indifference with their diet of economic rationalism, but people who knew better and did nothing. People like me. I make another coffee, this one black and bitter, 
and start planning my campaign. This month's review book is Death Most Definite by Trent Jameson. Trent Jameson is well known in speculative fiction circles as a significant talent, writing beautifully crafted tales that often have a baroque sensibility and resonate on an emotional level. I thought I knew the type of first novel Trent would write, but Death Most Definite delivered quite a surprise. The tone of the piece is incredibly light, which wasn't what I expected at all, particularly for a novel dealing with people, pomps they're called, whose job it is to ease the passage of newly dead souls from our world to the underworld. But putting aside my preconceptions, I entered a novel that drew me along at an incredibly fast pace, that made me smile, and that showed, as we learnt along with protagonist Stephen de Selby, just what it is to be a pomp, just what they can do, and just how bad things can go when a hostile corporate takeover of the regional pomp office means all your co-workers are bumped off, and, as you're one of the last pomps left in Australia, have to tear painfully through you to get to the spirit world. But Stephen de Selby is more resourceful than people give him credit for, and teaming up with newly dead ex-pomp Lissa, who Stephen thinks is a bit of all right, even though things would never work out between them with her being a ghost and all, embarks in a mission to avenge his dead friends and family, stop a zombie takeover of Australia, and most importantly, stay alive. Trent acknowledges that Death Most Definite tips more than a nod at the works of Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman and Fritz Lieber. And you can see that in what is an enjoyable, engaging and, at times, blood-soaked romp through Brisbane with very likeable characters, a richly imagined underworld and the kind of love story you can cheer for. Can death be fun? Most definitely. Four stars. Death Most Definite is published in Australia by Orbit. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of the publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2010. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it.